from being very young, I can recall thinking how unusual my grandmother's name was. She was called Alice Mary Jamrak, and she lived in Ossis in West Yorkshire, where she ran a fish and chip oil at the bottom of Dale Street. As a child in the early 60s, I'd be taken once a week to visit, and to this day I've got fond memories of sitting in the back parlour eating chips and slowly absorbing the family lore by immersion in the adult's idle gossip. Despite my grandmother being a businesswoman, she was far from wealthy, and I recall that there was no bath in the house, although latterly an indoor toilet had been added to save the trudge across the yard to visit the outside clodgy. Living with Grandma Rosset was, uh, uh, was Uncle Maurice and his wife Brenda. Grandma was certainly the matriarch of the house, quite portly, and with a very sharp tongue, she certainly ruled the roost over this culinary empire that she ran. I never got to meet Reg Jamrak, who was my granddad. He died in 1959, shortly before I arrived here. Uh, growing up, I'd hear his name in conversation, though then and even now he remained something of a historical figure to me. My mother, uh, Constance Vera Jamrak, or Connie, very clearly had fond memories of her father, who seems to have been a very quiet, gentle, generous and thoughtful man. His one great failing seems to have been his name, which was a source of misery to her, even through to childhood when she got teased uh, about it and eventually got to leave it behind when she became Mrs. Kendall in 1953. So apart from this unusual name, there was little to mark my mother's family out from any other in a small Yorkshire town before the Second World War. That is, perhaps, with the exception that my granddad wasn't from Yorkshire, a trivial thing today, but uh, far more unusual in those days for an off Comden to turn up and move into town. In fact, granddad was originally from Plymouth and grew up in Wakefield with his brothers Les and Edgar and his sisters Winnie, Lily and Reenie. They'd moved north from Plymouth during a bout of poverty, a fraction of the information that did come uh, to my ears in later life, probably around my late teens, was that the Jamrecks had a more colourful past than simply being chip shop proprietors. And I began to hear exciting things about far off places, lost wealth and animal importing. And this was all too distant and far fetched to be real for me until I read a potted family history put together by my mum's uncle Edgar. In this history, uh, Uncle Edgar describes stories of his grandfather in particular, who was one of the animal importing Jamrecks. Apparently the stories of their enterprise were absolutely boundless, as I'm sure you can imagine, and a tiny fraction of the tales to be told come in Edgar's notes. In them he describes a consignment of monkeys breaking out from their cages and climbing into the rigging of a sailing ship that was bringing them back to London. In Uncle Edgar's notes, he indicated that his forebears had the Germanic name Yamrak rather than Jamrak, and were indeed animal importers who moved their business from Hamburg to a menagerie in London's East End. This was an unbelievable finding to an impressionable young man, who thought with the exception of a few personal achievements for a few family members, that frankly we were a pretty dull lot. And it was therefore pretty exciting to learn that Somewhere in our past, at least, with this set of madmen going all over the Victorian world, getting animals and bringing them into Europe. It was, frankly, a little bit like Bilbo Baggins finding out about the shamefully risk-taking Tuck side of his family. And so I lived happily with the knowledge that the family had a little bit more colour than I'd previously thought, but never really set out to investigate what could be researched on my forebears. And that was until recently when... Uh, re researching the Jamrecks uh, until now would have meant hours spent in musty records books of churches, registry offices, libraries etc. But of course with the advent of the internet and the explosion of the content on there I've been able to very easily turn up a plethora of fascinating facts which for me were simply jaw-dropping. It seems that my earliest animal importing ancestor was one Johann Gotthold Jamrak who owned and ran the Handel's Menagerie in Hamburg. He must have been quite the entrepreneur, as it seems he also owned menageries in Antwerp and latterly in London. 
Why the name Yamrak rather than Jamrak, my mother's maiden name? Well, it does seem that the change occurred during the First World War, when of course possession of a Germanic name was a less than fashionable accessory. Johann Gosshold Jamrak, Yamrak died in 1863, and it was son Charles who then went on to sell the menagerie to a German called Karl Hagenbeck. Hagenbeck was a local fishmonger turned showman, and he went on to use Yamrak's collection to establish his tier park in 1863. The tier park was famous and even rivalled Hamburg Zoo for visitors' numbers by having a constant supply of new and unusual animals. And these included wonders not previously seen in Europe before, such as Sumatra and an African rhinoceros. Eventually, the tier park itself surpassed Hamburg Zoo in popularity. Today, the only zoo in Hamburg is Hagenbeck's. Now, by the time Charles had sold his father's menagerie, Charles himself had emigrated to London some 20 years earlier, and there had been established the largest animal importation business in Europe and probably the world, and so Charles himself was very well known. Charles was born Johann Christian Karl Yamrak in Memel in East Prussia in 1815. He seems to have changed his name to Charles when he became a British citizen in 1856. Contemporary journal articles written about Jamrak make it clear that his business was really global. Orders came in from all over the world, including Tehran, Constantinople, Cairo, St. Petersburg. He had this sort of monopoly on the rather unusual business of animal importing in Europe, Though ironically the only city whose public gardens rarely came to him was London. Apparently there was a feeling among the curators of the zoo that it wouldn't be sufficiently impressive if an animal was known to have been bought in London docks. Instead they preferred to make offers to zoos on the continent who had duplicated their animals. Though in nearly every case the animal had been previously sold by Jamrak. His dominion did not extend to America, however, uh, largely because Jamrak felt that the transatlantic voyage was unacceptably dangerous for the animals, and so it seems he mainly focused on supplying uh, European zoos and animal collectors with animals coming from the Indian subcontinent and from Africa. Now, why did he set up his business in London? Well, of course, London was, and really still is, one of the great ports of the world. In Victorian England, the docks of the East End were one of the most cosmopolitan places on earth, and sailors and cargo from all corners of the modern world arrived there. Many were returning from journeys to new worlds from whence they'd return with individual treasures to trade. Many of these treasures would be Eastern curiosities, whilst others were living, and the Jamricks established a unique menagerie among the docks where they could exploit the need to trade animals for zoos, museums, pet shops and private collections. Jamrak's Emporium became established initially in East Smithfield before moving to the infamous Ratcliffe Highway. The Ratcliffe Highway at Lassily Court St George's Street was notorious throughout London and probably throughout the world. Life there for Charles Jamrak must have been extremely hard. The highway held its right place in infamy for a variety of reasons. Certainly among these were two sequential mass murders that occurred 12 days apart in 1811. Interestingly, these crimes catalyzed Robert Peel to establish London's first police force, the Peelers, or Bobbies as they were known. Not that it did much good for the Ratcliffe Highway, where it was reported that the new Bobbies had to move through the district in threes simply to avoid attack. The place seems to have been a pretty lawless and wild cesspit, populated by salubrious grog shops, thieves, prostitutes and opium dens, all waiting with predatory webs designed to trap the unwary. Ratcliffe Highway was certainly famous among sailors of the day, and there is a song known as Ratcliffe uh, Highway, which was a folk song or sea shanty, and referred to the drinking shops and the prostitution around the place. As I was a riding down a whopping, as I rambled down a rectified way, I chanced to step into a gin shop, 
spend a long night and a day. Young Doxy came a rolling up to me, and she asked if I'd money to spook for a bottle of wine, James de Guinea. She quickly replied, "That's the soul." The bottle was put on the table. There were glasses for everyone. When I asked for the change of me guinea, she tipped me a verse of her song. She placed both her hands on her hips, saying, "Sailor, you don't know our fashion. You think you're on board your ship. Well, if this is your fashion to rob me, it's a fashion I'll never abide. So I won't shout the change of me guinea, or else I'll give you a broadside." Contemporary writers describe an almost Elizabethan street scene of stench and filth underfoot in the highway. Into this sort of bacchanalian corruption stepped sailors who might have been at sea for many months or even years. Their pockets were overflowing with money and it wasn't long before hornpipe dancing sailors of every hue and colour were reeling from the effects of tainted rum and jigger gin. Malays and Lascars drank side by side with weather-beaten men of the Antarctic. They describe a constant fracas interspersed by random violence from beatings to wild knife fights. This reputation was to stay with the area for many years and was only amplified by the Cable Street riots that occurred in the same area before the Second World War. These of course involve the fascist black shirts of Mosley as the area had become largely Jewish and Mosley was actively anti-Semitic. But it was back in Charles Jamrak day that the place really enjoyed its most fearsome reputation. Those were the days of Jack the Ripper, and although Jack was more associated with his activities in neighbouring Whitechapel, he almost certainly walked the same streets as the Jamraks during exactly the same time period. In fact, the Ripper's fifth and final official victim, Mary Kelly, was a prostitute from the area who was found disemboweled in a room off of Dorset Street. This was a short walk from Jamrak's premises in Bet Street. In a 1908 retrospective, one of the old brigade, Donald Shaw wrote of London in the 1860s. He described the killing of another naturalist who had a shop just up the street from Jamrak's. He was attacked at two in the afternoon within 50 yards of his own door and succumbed to his injuries within 24 hours. All of which helps to make me realise just how tenuous my hold in existence was and also what a risk Jamrak ran just living in this sordid area. <laughs> 